So let us begin this session. Uh, this is a session on gravitational wave astrophysics. As we all know that gravitational waves have op opened up new vistas in astrophysics. It has allows, allowed us to see things we ha hadn't seen or even anticipated before. And it has brought in new ways of measuring things which you know, we, uh, we did not have access to before. Gravitational wave astrophysics has a wide slew of subjects, which uh, some of which have actually been covered in, in uh, previous sessions, including dense matter, you know, kilonovae, nucleosynthesis, and so on. Uh, but even without that, there is plenty to discuss. And to do so in our session, uh, you know, three expert panelists, Satya Prakash, Yajasvi Venumadhav, and uh, Saurabh Chatterjee. We'll start with Satya Prakash. Thank you very much, uh, Dipankar. And I also would like to thank uh, ICTS for allowing us to organize this uh, meeting in honor of Bala. Uh, the schools here and the workshops are now world famous, and many students that I meet uh, who have been through one of these programs. Keep continuing this, and thank you, ICTS. I'm really standing here uh, on behalf of an unknown astronomer or astrophysicist. Um, organizers were not supposed to give any talks or chair sessions, but we ran out of people. OK, so let's start, without further ado, about uh, the overview. So I'm going to start with, um, I don't think that's the overview I wanted, but anyway. Um, expected detection rate of binary coalescences is one of the first things that we conclude from uh, the population that we see. Uh, then I'm going to discuss about the properties of the observed events. Um, and what is in store for electromagnetic colors now and, and, and in the future, and what other sources we can expect to observe. I conclude with a short list of questions, challenges, uh, which we may discuss during the discussion session. Um, I will not be able to cover all aspects, obviously, because I'm thousands of papers that have been written on the astrophysical aspects in the last part, in the past three years. So it is just a sample of things that we have observed. If you can just lower the lights a little bit, not all my slides are dark. Um, LIGO and Virgo discoveries have really started a new era in fundamental physics, astrophysics, and cosmology. And today we're going to focus on just the astrophysical aspects. So this slide, which you already saw, in Archana's uh, talk, shows you the binary black holes and the 10 of them and the lone binary neutron star detected during the first and second observing runs. But they are already impacting astrophysics in a way that I will talk about in a few minutes. But let me also tell you that starting from the third observing run, the LIGO Virgo collaboration started issuing public alerts. These public alerts are made as made available as quickly as possible. Uh, we can generate triggers in some cases within a minute. And the information that is provided is the sky map in various different formats and some information about what type of signal it is. That's what we were discussing in the previous session whether we expect the event to contain a neutron star. So far, <clears throat> uh, if you go to that link, there are totally 19 astrophysical alerts that we believe are astrophysical in origin. In addition, that there are four more that have been retracted. You know, you send out an alert, and then you do follow-up analysis. You learn that, oh, this is not likely not a gravitational wave signal, either because there was something peculiar happening near the event. And there are four or two events with matter, uh, but no electromagnetic observations have uh, been reported so far. This, these slides were written with the uh, you know, view that as, this, this session would take place before the previous session. So you already heard there were no electromagnetic observations. I will also be mentioning in some of my slides 
what the future holds, because that's what this uh, conference uh, workshop is about. So future of gravitational wave astronomy, which means we have to talk about the capabilities of current generation of detectors um, indicated by this, represented by advanced LIGO, but in the future, 20 years, maybe 25, we hope to have this Einstein telescope and cosmic explorer with observing capabilities on the horizon is the top line. We really see nothing beyond that, so that's not the capabilities of these detectors. It's more like 10% detected, which is this first you know, dark shaded line, the border of dark shaded line that you should consider. That is the kind of nominal reach. I mean, we will certainly observe you know, quite a few events in that region. And um, if you want to 50, you know, the reach to 50% detected, then it is a lower boundary is what you should, uh, you should consider. So this plot tells you that the current advanced LIGO detectors can eventually detect sources at a maximum distance of redshift of two, and that's already cosmological. You can learn a lot of things about stars and how they form and evolve. But in addition to that, um, going beyond redshift of 10 means that you'll be able to uh, probe the universe when possibly no stars were there, no objects were there. And that's remarkable in two ways. One, it gives you a glimpse into the universe uh, at the birth of the first light and, and, and beyond. Uh, and secondly, for nearby events, the signal to noise ratio could be very large. For instance, for something like uh, 150914, we are talking about signal to noise ratio of 1,000 or more, depending on its orientation with respect to us. Now, the events that were detected during the first and second observing run we have no doubt that they are astrophysical in origin. What has been plotted here is the noise model, which is in blue. Noise in our detector as a function of some ranking statistic falls really extremely rapidly. And as a function of that, the events that we see, the, what we call the foreground, is, pl is plotted in green. If you take the signal, so if you take the noise plus, sorry, that's the noise plus signal model. Uh, the signal model is buried underneath it. For most part, the, these two are really the same. Um, uh, and it has been done with two different uh, uh, pipelines. And you see that in one of these, there is, sorry, in this one here, there's one additional event, binary black hole event, compared to the other. Otherwise, these are very consistent, producing very consistent uh, results. Uh, it, this is including 170817. This did not, uh, at least not in the uh, width that is shown here, the range that is shown here. Uh, so these are uh, really significant, but they will be events buried even in the region where the two are indistinguishable. And to pick them out, one has to do a subthreshold search where you combine the subthresholds with another sort of observation. It could be gamma rays, it could be electromagnetic, other type of electromagnetic observations. And that is something that's currently, we are trying to do with SWIFT, combining subthresholds with SWIFT, subthresholds with Fermi, and gravitational wave observations, we have a better chance of detecting. Now, as a summary slide, I have included the most important groundbreaking science from gravitational wave observations so far. It includes not only astrophysical implications, but also other implications. These are the rates that we conclude, uh, confirm the existence of merging black hole binaries with rates anywhere between 10 and 100 per year per gigaparsec cube. What that means for advanced LIGO is that there may be an event every day. Uh, binary neutron star mergers, uh, 100 to 4,000 per year per gigaparsec cube is the current estimate. And the second, uh, this event here, allowed us to measure the equation of state of neutron star, neutron stars, determining the neutron star radius to be 
if I, if I take the overall range from all the different ways of computing, it's between something like 9 and 13 kilometers. Gravitational waves, we have confirmed, travel at the speed of light with a precision of one part in 10 to the 15 or better. It's also confirmed gravitational wave generation beyond the quadrupole formula. We have detected tails of gravitational waves, absorption of radiation by black holes, confirming these things in the sense that general relativity, the general relativistic effects are consistent uh, with the observation when, when we consider these effects. We are, yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, it's there in one of the uh, post-Newtonian terms. It's there. I can show you uh, in spare time. You know, if you ask me, I'll pull up the slides and show you. You don't think so? OK, Let, we'll, we'll discuss. Uh, we discovered a completely new class of black holes, we, we think, uh, greater than 30 solar mass black holes, but spin very close to zero. This would be a challenge to theoretical astrophysics. How do we form these? Where do they come from? It's not entirely unpredicted in the sense that with some people who are saying black hole masses could be as large as 50 solar masses and we should be searching for them, but nobody expected the spins to be close to zero. Um, that's really a puzzle. Uh, the origin of short GRBs has been resolved. Uh, this we heard a lot earlier, so we should probably you know, move on to the next. Uh, topic helped identify sites of heavy element production. So let me, now the rest of them, we can stop anytime you move on. That's the summary, that's the overview. So I'll keep a watch uh, on, on things and then stop whenever, you know, as soon as that goes. So mass and spin distributions are things that we have observed. So this is the summary slide from this paper here, which shows you what is the distribution of masses, the component masses, M1 and M2, in the M1 and M2 plane of the various uh, sources that we have detected. Uh, so it's range of masses that we have detected. Uh, even though the heavier masses could be seen to greater distances, we don't see them in the same number as in this region here, telling us that they are more rarer in the universe. You may see, oh, they're a larger number, but they really cover much greater volume, but there are not as many, which means that we can already start to measure the mass function, but unfortunately, just 10 detections don't allow us to do that, but that's something that's going to happen pretty soon. We observe systems that are consistent with equal mass, except this one system, GW0729, for which the follow-up analysis by this group gives you a mass ratio of 0.3 to 0.8. In fact, 0.8 is the limit, and it's probably smaller than that. Spin of the remnant is less than external for all systems. I'll come back to this in a minute. And that may be something that's puzzling as well. What about the chirp mass and distance? Uh, distance is not very well determined especially when we have you know, objects that are far away, distances don't get determined extreme, I mean, very well. So those are the range of distances anywhere between 40 megaparsec for the one in neutron star here to all the way up to the heaviest system, 170729. They are at various distances up to a few gigaparsec. We are reaching uh, cosmological distances already. Now, the mass ratio and is not very well determined. However, as I already mentioned, uh, we seem to have mostly observed equal mass systems, but that is a bias in our observation. That's not entirely surprising. Uh, we are not at a point where we can conclude that, oh, the universe consists of mostly equal mass planets. That's not the case. We have a bias in the observation itself, and so we are observing mostly equal mass systems is not surprising. But I think this is surprising, because effective spin seems to be consistent with zero, as this plot shows here. It's a certain combination, mass weighted combination of the spins, and that being close to zero is really surprising. It's as though it is merger of two Schwarzschild black holes. Why? Because we actually have um, sensitivity to aligned spin binaries, equal mass, 
to greater distances than spin zero binaries. Why is this? We don't quite understand. Maybe these are all systems with random spins such that they appear to be um, spin consistent with zero, but we don't know that. Uh, there seems to be no correlation between the various parameters that we are detecting, the early to say, because mass ratio is very large errors, as you see in this diagram, but it doesn't seem to have any correlation with chi effective because chi effective is mostly zero, but that is the possible. Um, most importantly, we don't, we're not at sensitive to precision. If there is any precision in the system, which has lots of relativistic effects that we could uh, explore, just keeping within general relativity, that doesn't seem to be there. So there's no evidence for precision, or the other way of saying is data is insensitive to spin precision so far. And posterior distributions in this case then are similar to the prior itself that we put. So the final point I want to make is about the remnant mass and spin. This is not something that we measure directly. It is something that is inferred from the pre-merger signal that we observe. And that seems to produce for you black holes as though they formed from Swatch, you know, final black holes, curved black holes, as though they formed from initially Swatch shield black holes. Uh, that may not be the case, as I already mentioned. And uh, if we don't begin to observe deviations significantly from this, theoretical astrophysics of formation models might be in trouble. Are we sensitive to prior? I just should show two slides here to show you one has used different priors, but the posterior seem to be more or less consistent, independent of what priors you use. This one here is for chirp mass. This is for chi effective. They all seem to be not dependent so much on prior. Now rates. This is the most important one. It's something that is also a challenge to astrophysics, especially the binary neutron star case. And that's because the event occurred very close to us. So these are the various systems that we have observed, binary black holes, and one binary neutron star that has not been shown. And what you see is, uh, you know, distance estimate not so very well determined, but it still allows us by modeling our detectors, you know, how far they can observe given their sensitivity, we can get the rates. And that is a large simulation that you have to do uh, in, in injecting in our data uh, mock signals and trying to take them out. And that finally leads to a rate for binary black holes as given by this. It depends on what you prior you use. I mean, in the earlier part I said, you know, everything is prior independent, more or less. But here, it strongly depends on the prior. If you use a flat in log for masses, then you get one distribution, which is this blue. And if you use a power law, some power law with power law index, you get another uh, determination for rates. Now these two, give, I mean, if you, the all encompassing rate here, 90% rate is about 10 to 100 per year per gigaparsec cube. But the binary neutron star with a single event, you determine it to be anywhere between 100 to 4,000 per year per gigaparsec cube. Uh, this is a challenge. I mean, if, especially if that rate is more than about 300 per year per gigaparsec cube, the current certain models simply cannot explain that. Uh, there are papers that are being written uh, in uh, the literature that if this lower end rate, we need to keep watching it, it moves higher, we'll be in trouble. Now, formation scenarios, I'm not going to talk about that at all. I, you know, Saurabh has a wonderful set of slides, so I'm just going to go through. I mean, you don't even need to look at it. He's going to talk about all this, I guess. So the thing that I was going to say is, in addition to those two scenarios, probably LIGO, Virgo, black holes came from primordial uh, universe. If that's the case, uh, there's already quite a bit of constraint on what primordial black hole would contribute to the dark matter uh, in the universe, and that may be in some cases, there are some small windows where they could be as much as you want. However, it's mostly constrained to be less than at least one-tenth of the density required. And in future, we will be able to constrain it not just in that region of stellar mass black holes, but sub-solar mass black holes, 
And there is no way to produce those subsolar mass black holes except by primordial origin. And that would be fantastic with third generation detectors. We can go as low as something like one part in 10 to the four, constraining it better than that for you know, masses less than one solar mass. That would be fantastic with third generation. I'll spend less than a minute on low latency analysis and EM alerts. This is to really enable multi-messenger astronomy that we are all talking about here. It spectacularly uh, identified formation of formation sites for heavy elements. We all know that. But 3G network, as you saw, heard in the previous session, there are lots of uh, questions that remain. But 3G network will help identify thousands of kilonova and trace the origin of heavy elements and resolve the various questions surrounding it. However, there is motivation for observing these alerts even before the actual merger takes place. And there are a list of them. And we can enable it. So if you look at the uh, time before collisions as a function of frequency, uh, the signal to noise ratio might be as large as 11 one minute before merger, which means we should be able to send out alerts at least, no, at most one minute before merger, and people can begin to observe such systems. And here is a sky localization. Just watch that upper frequency there. You know, different frequencies correspond to the latency, 58 hertz, seconds for 29 hertz, and so on. And as you keep going, the sky area that you can observe keeps on reducing. And finally, when you reach 1024 hertz, you would reach a very small region. So we might be able to send about one alert of this kind during the advanced LIGO sensitivity. And that's what we're hoping to do so that astronomers can really focus on an extremely small region and observe such things. And that's all I'm going to say. And if there are questions, then I can answer them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Satya. Now, if there are urgent questions related to this, we'll take them now. If there are if they can wait, then we'll take it at the panel. Yes, I think. Mm -hmm. The one minute thing that you just mentioned, that really refers to um, the ground-based detectors, right? And because with LISA, you might be able to get warning. Oh, that's correct. Uh, you know, in the, in the multi-messenger era, which I had some slides to make in the question session, we can go, we could do it uh, months or years in advance. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.